to this evening program, a lecture by Dr. P. R. Vasudev Rao. On behalf of MCNS, I welcome Dr. Vasudev Rao to our Science Week program, being celebrated in memory of Sir C. V. Raman, a Nobel laureate from our country. Dr. Vasudev Rao has been in touch with MCNS, has visited MCNS earlier, and has given talks. He was the director of Indira Gandhi, a center for atomic research, during my last few years in IGK. I knew him only as a head of a department or a director of a group or a director of a center and now as the vice chancellor of the prestigious BNI. However, by nature, he has been quite approachable. <laughs> and friendly to anyone, and he has been moving with me as a friend. He advised me to write a book on nuclear reaction data when he was my director. And now it ended up as chapters in a recent book on reactive physics published through his initiative. So I'm, this is an opportunity for me to personally thank him in that, in that respect. Today, Though he is very busy, having committed to give a technical talk in another conference on the 125 years of radioactivity, he has been kind enough to find time and to accept our invitation. We are blessed and grateful to him to be back with MCNS on this occasion. He has chosen to talk about a great SNT visionary of India, namely Dr. Omi Baba. A few words of introduction about Dr. P.R. Vasudevara. Dr. Piyar Vasudevara is presently the Vice Chancellor of Kumi Baba National Institute, HBNI, a deemed to be university and the DAE. He was formerly the Director of Indira Gandhi Center for Atomic Research. He is a specialist in actinate chemistry and particularly the chemistry of nuclear fuel cycle. Dr. Rao obtained his BSc chemistry degree from the University of Madras and thereafter joined the Department of Atomic Energy in the year 1972. He worked in the Radio Chemistry Division of the ARP till August 1978. He obtained his PhD degree in Chemistry from the University of Bombay in 1979 for his work on Chemistry of Actinate Elements. He shifted to Indira Gandhi Center for Atomic Research IG Car at Kalpakam in 1978 and rose to the position of its director. And he superannuated as director in August 2015. He has over 300 publications in peer-reviewed international journals. Dr. Rao has guided 15 students for their PhD degree. Dr. Rao was selected for the MRSA medal lecture in 1998 and the MRSA Senior Superconductivity and Materials Award in 2011. He was also selected for the silver medal of the Chemical Research Society of India in 2011. He was given the INS. Indian Nuclear Society Award in the year 2007 for his outstanding contributions in nuclear fuel cycle. He was one of the vice presidents of MRSE during 2015-2018. He is an elected fellow of Indian National Academy of Engineering and National Academy of Sciences, India, Lahabar. He was recently selected to deliver the prestigious H.L. Roy Memorial Lecture by the Indian Institute of Chemical Engineers. He founded the Southern Regional Chapter of Indian Association of Nuclear Chemists and Allied Scientists and through uh, IAMCAS has organized and taken part in a large number of programs in schools and colleges to educate the students regarding radioactivity and its applications. He also founded the Society for Advancement of Chemical Sciences and Education at Kalpakam and was its first president. Listing all his achievements and recognitions would demand a book. I will stop here and welcome Dr. Rao to take over the session for his talk on Tony Bob. Thank you, Dr. Rao, and over to you, Dr. Rao. Uh, I hope you can see me and hear me. Yes, we are able to see you and we are able to hear you clearly. Okay, okay. I'll just uh, try to share my presentation now. Hello. 
meningkat. Director 
of the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, in 1933, and he was uh, honored with the Bharat, Bharat Ratna by the government of India. Now, just for the uh, young students to our uh, in the audience, uh, we know that C. V. Raman first observed Raman effect when he was traveling by a ship. This is again characteristic of many of the very eminent scientists. Their mind is constantly in turmoil. Their mind is constantly thinking about what they see in front of them. Each unexplained observation makes them lose sleep. That is what is very typical of great scientists. So they started thinking about why this, this ocean is blue. And why is the sky blue? It's because of Rayleigh scattering. That was known at the time. But why is the ocean blue when the water does not have its color? Is it because it reflects the color of the sky? Well, it was Dr. Raman whose work showed that the answer is not the reflection, but light scattering by water molecules. It is called as Raman scattering. Now, particularly for the students and even for the faculty and the young researchers, I would like to mention about uh, Raman's uh, uh, book, which is, he has written along with the uh, notation in 1947, in which uh, he has uh, talked about books that influenced him. This is very important for students because very often when we go to the library and see books or when we attend lectures, we easily come to the conclusion, this book is not important for me, this lecture is outside my syllabus, this is not relevant to me and so on. If this was the way people learned, they would not have become great. You can see what Raman says, I finished my school and college career and the university examinations at the age of 80. But in this short span of years had been compressed the study of four languages and of a great variety of diverse subjects starting from ancient Greek and Roman history, formal logic, economics, public finance, chemistry. Do you think all of these are connected with his work on physics later? No, but it brought on his perspective greatly. Dozen branches of pure applied mathematics and of course experimental and theoretical physics. The nearest point to which I can trace of idealism is my recollection of reading Edwin Arnold's great book, The Light of Asia. And the next set of books I have to mention is one of the most memorable works of my all time, namely The Elements of Euclid. Speaking of the modern world, the supermost figure in my judgment is that of Helmholtz. It profoundly influenced my intellectual outlook. I understood from its producer what scientific results really meant and how it could be undertaken. So you can see in his own words how reading well beyond your curriculum, well beyond your syllabus is something very important if you want to continue as a scientist. You can never shut off yourself from the development from the adjacent domains thinking that they are not relevant to me, but at some time they will become relevant. Another important characteristic which we need to learn from uh, Raman was his patriotism. When uh, Raman went to receive the Nobel Prize, this is what the uh, experience he shares. When the Nobel Award was announced, I saw it as a personal triumph, an achievement for me and my collaborators, a recognition for a very remarkable discovery for reaching the goal I had pursued for seven years. But when I sat in the crowded hall and I saw the sea of western faces surrounding me and I, the only Indian in my turban and closed coat, it dawned on me that I was really representing my people and my country. I felt truly humbled when I received the prize from King Gustav. It was a moment of great emotion, but I could restrain myself. But then I turned around and saw the British Union Jack under which I had been sitting. You know, India was not free at that time. It was still under the British Empire. And it was a British Union Jack flag under which he was sitting. It was then that I realized that my poor country, India, did not even have a flag of her own. And it was this that triggered off my complete breakdown. And he cried there when after receiving the Nobel Prize. One can see the element of patriotism in the person. And I do not know how many of uh, today's generation shares this kind of intensity of patriotism, which is very important even in a scientist, even though science is global. 
Last slide on Raman, again for the youngsters and the students. It is very important that uh, we don't focus only on education, but on overall development of our personality. And this is in his words, I think your education is imperfect. If you do not realize, my young friends, that life is not merely a question of getting food, clothes and shelter. Man does not give by bread alone. This has been realized from ancient times. I think that the finest things in life are not these, but music, color, flowers, beauty, aesthetic sense, and the satisfaction derived from these. It is these kind of things in life that make life worth living. So my, I would like to ask the students, I always tell them uh, uh, the, the old story where the teacher asked the student, what would you like to be? And the student said, I would like to be happy. And the teacher said, so you have not understood life. And she said, the student said, you have not understood what it is to be happy. Well, that is how uh, uh, I would like to stop at this point and go to the uh, the uh, primary topic of my uh, webinar today, that is Dr. Homi Baba. Homi Baba was a multifaceted personality. Why should I talk about him? It's because he is commonly known as the father of India's nuclear program. I and mean, everybody knows only that much, very often. Very often people do not know several other things about him which are very, very important. First, of course, his own scientific brilliance. That he discovered several phenomena, some of them are named after him, some of the epoch making discoveries in cosmic, cosmic ray physics and particle physics, that is not so well known to youngsters. Specialistic institution building, he created not just atomic energy, he created TFR first and then DAE, then atomic energy establishment at Trombay and several other institutions, as we will see when we go on. He had a great management style, very unique style of building programs around people. And we will see some of the examples of his management. Excellent articulation. I have seen, his, I have seen uh, several books containing a complete transcript of his lectures. And it's a pleasure to read. Fantastic English and excellent emphasis on the right points. I cannot imagine the kind of articulation which a scientist uh, has in India beyond this. And lastly, such a great versatility. He was not just a scientist, he was scientist and artist, and he had an eye for beauty. I will illustrate some of these as I go along. And more, more important than any of this is that in our life, we always have something called our primary profession. And we have several things which are called hobbies. It was not the case with Homi Baba. He took every activity that he pursued equally seriously, whether it was science or art. He put in his best efforts and excelled in every one of them. So that is what is very really unique about him and I would like to illustrate in the coming uh, 45 minutes. Childhood uh, himself was quite special for Homi Baba because he came from an aristocratic family in uh, the morning Mumbai in 1909. He took, uh, he was surrounded by books, art masterpieces, Beethoven music, even when he was young. He took art lessons from young age. He won several prizes for artists under 18. And he was familiar with many of the major symphonies of Mozart, Bach, and other classical music, even when he was very young. But his, the, the clarity of what he needs to pursue was always in his mind. His father and his uncle wanted to, uh, who was uh, no, Dora Tata, he wanted him to become an engineer and ultimately join Tata Iron and Steel Company at Jamshed. So, Homi Baba was a very, very important member of the Tata family and it was obvious that they wanted him to continue the legacy. Homi Baba joined Mechanical Sciences Tricos, but his interests were in physics. So, he wrote to his father from UK in 1928. It was just at the age of 18 that uh, clarity is seen, expressing his burning desire to do physics. He completed mechanical sciences tripos with first class in 1930 and mathematics tripos in 1932, both. This is a letter from to his father. You can see the beautiful language and the conviction. I seriously said to you, 
that business or job as an engineer is not the thing for me. It is totally foreign to my nature and radically opposed to my temperament and opinions. Physics is my line. I know I shall do great things here. For each man can do best and excel in only one thing of which he is passionately fond, in which he believes as I do, and that he has the ability to do it. That which he is in fact born and destined to do it. My success will not depend on what A or B thinks of me, and my success will be what I will make of my work. So it was very obvious he was uh, telling everyone that with the example which is often quoted and ascribed to Einstein that you cannot ask, an, uh, ask a fish to climb up a tree. So if in a class we have a fish and we have an elephant and we have a dog and we try to give the examination with the question which is say, all of you demonstrate climbing a tree, obviously many of them will fail. But that is not the way it is to be. Each one has its own speciality. He said, I am burning with the desire to physics. I will and must do it at that some time. It is my only ambition. I have no, it's the next paragraph you see is saying, it is no use saying to Beethoven, you, are, you must be a scientist because it's a great thing. When he did not care two hoots for science. You cannot tell Socrates, be an engineer. It is a work of an intelligent man. It is not in the nature of things. I therefore earnestly implore you to let me do physics. He wrote to his father, his father had a deal with him, ultimately a bargain. If you get a first class engineering degree, you are already studying engineering, then I would finance you to continue at Cambridge for two more years to do physics as part of the mathematics prize course. Of course, Homi Baba graduated. He is the first class in engineering. Many people do not know this. He was just not a physicist. He was also an engineer. And that was very clear in his later work. And he also later got first class in the mathematics prize course. He was surrounded by great teachers and mentors all the time, many of them Nobel Prize winners. Homi Baba was taught by Paul Dirac, who was professor of mathematics at Cambridge and was Nobel Prize winner for his work on quantum theory. And using a traveling student fellowship which he got, uh, he was allowed to travel with some fellowship given by the institute. He worked at Copenhagen with Niels Bohr and at Zurich with Wolfgang Pauli and at Rome with Enrico Fermi. All of these are Nobel laureates. And finally, at Cavendish, Cavendish Laboratory at uh, Oxford, he worked for his PhD under Fowler. And during his stay there, the lab went through a series of great discoveries. And he was in touch with all these greats. The Chadwick, James Chadwick, who discovered neutron. The John, John Cockroft, who discovered the artificial disintegration of light elements. And Blackhead who you know, demonstrated production of the electron positron pairs. So such was the upbringing of uh, Homi Baba and such was the ambience in which he studied physics. And it was uh, not a big surprise that with his determination and with the ambience both put together, he became great. And there were several early scientific achievements because of the nature of the audience and also because I myself, I am not uh, very good in physics, I cannot really explain it uh, so nicely the way Dr. Uh, the earlier speaker would explain many things about quantum physics. I would like to just uh, look at, uh, no, in a cursory manner, but try to explain what is special about this. His earlier scientific achievements included studies on relativistic exchange scattering between ele electron positron, very, very new concept which finally has come to be known as Baba scattering. If you go and utter this word anywhere in the theoretical physics uh, uh, groups, it will, will be seen with a great respect. Theory of production of electron and positron showers in cosmic ray, and it was uh, finally came to be known as Baba Heitler theory. I will explain a little bit about this. Prediction of relativistic time dilation effects in the decay of the meson, which uh, was among the first proofs of the theory of relativity, and speculation about the Yukawa particle, finally he suggested the name meson. So today if you use the word uh, meson for the particles, then it, the name, name has come uh, because of suggestion from Hongi Bao. Now, just for a moment, I will uh, digress into some simple topic because I need to bring uh, Dr. Hongi Baba's uh, scientific contribution the right perspective. We need to understand about electrons and positrons. I'm sure that most of the students would have studied this, that uh, 
mass can be converted to energy and energy can be really converted to mass because it is the energy but beyond 511 kb the photons can convert and then create a pair of electron and positron and electron and positron can annihilate by you no know, because they have opposite charges here when they meet each other they annihilate and then they create photons of 511 kb so this can this is a very well known phenomenon that high energy radiation can really produce mass it can produce electrons and uh, positrons now the other point to be need to understand is what is bremsstrahlung radiation that is done in the box below bremsstrahlung radiation is electromagnetic radiation produced by deceleration of the charged particle when electrons or for that matter even other particles when they travel at the extremely high speeds approaching the speed of light and uh, when they are deflected then what they lose kinetic energy and convert it into radiation and that is the reason why you would have seen pictures of uh, reactor cores uh, like the picture of apsara reactor with the blue radiation which is coming because of bremsstrahlung so if we understand these two things our next steps are very clear now let us look at cosmic rays we know we are constantly bombarded by radiation from outer space and these are called cosmic rays and they are basically primary particles with very very high energy energetic protons basically to start with but it's not the protons which reach the earth it gets converted to several other particles and finally a shower is what is received at the earth as you can see from the picture now if you look at the cosmic rays in short we let us say a gamma ray enters the atmosphere at very very high energy it will collide with molecules and it will produce a cascade of lighter particles and then it is known that these showers which are received at the earth they are consisting of two types of particles one is the heavier particles it may be proton it can be muon it can be neutron these are found near the earth surfaces and second is a lighter particle like electrons and positrons and it is expected the normally that they should get shielded at higher in the higher atmosphere and they should not be seen at sea level but very very interestingly and it was a mystery at that point of time when homi baba was engaged in high energy physics they were able to find that there is a there is a large shower of fast electrons and positrons at sea level and baba along with hitler worked on cascade theory which is you know illustrated on the right side a gamma ray of very high energy uh, you know produces a pair of electron and positron both having very high energy and as they move along they produce bremsstrahlung and the gamma radiation which once again uh, after some time creates a pair of electrons and positrons and this is how this cascade starting from one gamma ray and producing one electron positron pair subsequently becomes a shower it is the high energy in the in the gamma ray to start with. finally that results through a series of bremsstrahlung and then positron electron pair creation that finally results in a shower of these particles in the uh, under air and this was baba's theory which was very nicely explained later on through a lot of experimental observations and you can see on the paper on the left side by, by baba which was published at the time the passage of fast electrons on the theory of cosmic showers uh, co-authored along with the hegler and uh, you can see the address as uh, uh, no gains at case college at cambridge this theory did not account for all the facts about uh, cosmic ray showers and to explain the penetrating component which is a heavier component baba made the far reaching hypothesis that there must exist a new particle with same characteristics as electron but approximately 100 times heavier and this is very very courageous prediction at that point of time today this particle is called muon which is approximately 200 times heavier than electron now let us look at muon sun time dilation this is another very really interesting aspect of baba's work which gave a direct proof of the theory of relativity I think this will be very easy for students to understand. Now, muons are unstable particles. They are created in the upper atmosphere. Okay, they move at 
high velocities and they are, if you measure their short uh, lifetime in your laboratory, you will find it's very short, 2 microseconds. Well, if you know that uh, it's a distance, if you know what distance they can travel before they die, you know their velocity and you know their lifetime like 2 microseconds, finally you will conclude that they cannot last beyond even 1 kilometer. It's within 1 kilometer they have to die because their lifetime is very short. But the thickness of the Earth's atmosphere is approximately 10 kilometers. Now, how these muons manage to travel 10 kilometers and reach the air right? when your if their lifetime itself does not permit? This was a very great question at that point of time. And Hogi Baba invoked the theory of relativity to explain this. At the bottom, you have an equation. I will not go into the theory of relativity at all, but let me tell you for the students' sake that the theory, the theory of relativity specifies that time gets dilated for a fast moving particle nearing the speed of light. So time is not the same for a person who is stationary and for a person who is moving. So I will not go into details of this, but then Baba used this part. But he said that a particle, you can think of it as a clock, and this clock runs very slow because the particle is running, the uh, moving very fast. Because of the high speed, in the equation if you write t0 divided by root of 1 minus v by c whole square, as the v becomes higher and higher, uh, the t will become t0. But if the v is uh, uh, v minus c whole square, so if you apply this equation, you will find that the, the time is very large. So you will find that you know, this muon is able to last the, the travel to 10 kilometers of atmosphere only because of the theory of relativity. And this proof by Homi Baba was really hard and hailed at that time as a special proof of the theory of relativity. And you can see the paper in which this appeared, nuclear forces, heavy electrons, and beta decay. And then he writes here about uh, the particles uh, living longer because they move very far, fast. So having discussed his work now, I, I want to conclude by saying that he had an excellent uh, collaboration an excellent uh, company in all its research. You see the photographs here with Paul Virat on the left side and the Niels Bohr here and uh, the uh, Cochrane here. This is another photograph which shows him walking along with Albert Einstein, Yukawa and Wheeler. So it was an elite company all the time. They gave, gave, gave great respect to Baba's knowledge and Baba could invite and learn many things from the great men with whom he worked. Baba returned to India in 1939 and he joined Indian Institute of Science as a leader in the physics department. And it was Dr. C. D. Raman, it's very interestingly, who was the head of the department of physics and he invited uh, Dr. Baba to join him and Baba joined him in 1939. And he, Baba became professor in 1942 and he was FRS, this fellow of Royal Society in 1941 at the age of 32 years, which was a record at the time. I cannot imagine many people who get that uh, unique international recognition at that age. Dr. Baba set up the Cosmic Ray Research Unit just to continue what work he was doing abroad with funds from Tata Trust. And then, but gradually, his mind started working differently. And fortunately for India, I must say, as a result of the World War, Second World War again started around that time. He was unable to return back to Europe and he had to stay back in India. And at this time, there was this transformation from theoretician to experimentalist. And he also started, started thinking about how to build science and technology in India. And this thought really started creating a seeds for great institutions to come in the years. Sir so, Sivi Raman himself, when he introduced uh, Homi Baba, at the annual meeting of the Indian Academy of Sciences in 1941, he said, Baba is a great lover of music, a gifted artist, a brilliant engineer, and an outstanding scientist. And he is the modern equivalent of Leonardo da Vinci. You can imagine kind of price we have showered on him by people like Sri Raman. And that shows kind of brilliance even at that time. And as he continued, he felt immediately that Indian science requires nurturing, for which we have to build special institutions. And he approached a chairman of the Dorothy Tata Trust, 
through a letter, very, very famous letter in 1944. And uh, if you read the text of the letter, you can see his very, very far-sighted thinking about Indian science and his confidence in Indian science. I had the idea that after the war, I would accept the job in a good university in Europe or America because universities like Cambridge or Princeton provide an atmosphere which no Indian university provides at the moment. But in the last two years, I have come more and more to the view that provided proper appreciation and financial support are forthcoming, it is one's duty to stay in one's own country. My young students who are listening to this, please note, it is one's duty to stay in one's own country and build up schools comparable with those that, are, that other countries are fortunate in possessing. Of course, we have to have proper appreciation in our own country. The scheme I am now submitting is but an embryo from which I hope to build up in the course of time a school of physics comparable to the best anywhere. And in this letter, he says, it is absolutely in the interest of India to have a vigorous school of research, not only in less advanced branches of physics, and also problems of immediate practical application to industry. If much of the applied research in India is disappointing or inferior quality, it is entirely due to absence of sufficient number of outstanding research workers. And then he ends the letter with a very visionary statement. Moreover, when nuclear energy has been successfully applied for power production in a couple of decades from now, India will not have to look abroad for its experts, but will find them ready at hand. It was an amazing forecast for several reasons. Most important, you will be amazed to think that he mentioned, he made this statement even before the world was given the news of nuclear energy. Because the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombings happened in 1945, August, and this is a statement from Hongi Baba in 1944 that nuclear energy will be successfully applied for power production in uh, several decades. He established TAFR in 1945, very next year, with money given by Tata Trust, and this became the cradle for the Indian Atomic Energy Program. This is the letter. I need not show the letter. The letter is very, very inspiring to read, the way it is clari no, clarity in thinking and visionary in approach. He built several institutions from this money, starting with the uh, starting of Atomic Energy Commission in 1947-48, Rare Earth Minerals, Atomic Energy Establishment, later on it was BARC at Trombay, then Apsara Reactor, then the BARC Training School, and the Canada India Reactor. And it went on even in space, launched, launched the first rocket from Tumba in 1963. TFR was a great institution to be started. Again, you can imagine, you can see here that he was not waiting for a building, he was not waiting for people. He started it in the Cosmic Ray Research Unit in Bangalore first, and then he inaugurated it in Bombay in a building called the Kennel Work, which is Better Road. And then moved into the old buildings of the Yacht Club in 1949. TFR did not have its own building or campus until 1962. But excellent groups in frontline areas of research uh, was created in TFR even before that because Baba invited several eminent experts, including Paul Dirac himself from abroad, including several Nobel laureates to spend time in India. Train younger faculty, he was also very happy to send, send younger faculty go abroad and work in eminent research team. He was building capability within the country even before he was building buildings. Finally, the, uh, you see photographs here, Baba speaking during the foundation stone, late 70, 1954, and inauguration in 1962. It was TIFR's pioneering work which resulted in a lot of scientific instruments being developed in the country, including the first digital computer of the country. You can see here Homi Baba showing that to Nehru, the first Indian digital computer at the TAFR. He created BRC, which was called at that time Atomic Energy Establishment, but the way he did it was very unique. He was deeply involved in every aspect of the establishment of the center. This is what I was mentioning to you in the beginning, not just the science building laboratories to making gardens. You can see him on the right side, standing in the open and inspecting the places, giving instructions to people 
including foreign architects who had to work with him for this uh, project. Finally, it was uh, created as the uh, Atomic Energy Establishment Trombay in on January 20th, 1957, and it was named as DRC in, on January 22, 1967, 10 years later, hardly 10 years later, because uh, Humi Baba uh, died very, very prematurely at that time. Apsana reactor was a very, very unique creation of uh, uh, Homi Baba. Very small team of 50 scientists and engineers built the reactor. And uh, what was unique about this reactor was this was the first reactor not only in India, but also in Asia. And very little was no, known about building reactors at that time. But Homi Baba was so confident about the indigenous development team that, you know, he, he even went into a friendly bet with the Dr. John Kankar Katra, who was the advisor director of the Atomic Energy Research Establishment at UK, that you just give me the fuel, rest everything, India will do on its own, and we will build the reactor in one year. And uh, really, Kakarov did not believe him, and they took a very friendly bet because they were very close friends. But the reactor attained critical energy before the date he had mentioned on August 4, 1956. Subsequently, he also built the Cyrus reactor. And again, by building this reactor, he, made, he ensured that the, half the fuel for the reactor was made in India itself. So one can see the emphasis on Atmanirbhar Bharat, or Mac in India, whatever call you call it today, it was there, even his minds, even in the 50s. So he was, uh, he was very sure that the entire fuel should not be uh, imported for this reactor. It was done for Apsara because that was first time. For this, he created facilities for fabricating fuel, and later, to expand the thinking further, in what we call today backward integration. So he started Atomic Mineral Survey in the country in 1949. Subsequently, it grew into Atomic Minerals Directory for exploration and research. He started exploration for rarers in 1950 by establishing Indian Rarers Limited. And then in 1963, it became a full-fledged government undertaking. And uh, we know that you know, in India, we have very, very unique uh, supply of rare earths and thorium in, uh, in our uh, pitch sands, comparable to the best in the world. And you know, it was uh, his uh, farsightedness that made him start an industry to, uh, to make use of the rare earths and uh, thorium and uranium from pitch sands. Dr. Baba also established Electronics Corporation of India Limited in Hyderabad. Uh, those of my generation, I don't know how many of you there will be uh, from my generation, one can one understand the importance of ECL. When first television was started in India, the entire country was filled with uh, ECIL made television sets. And I recall in Kalpatam, I don't know whether Dr. Gopal Krishnan will remember, that we had a few places where television was kept in public for people to see. Black and white television made by ECL. That was the impact of ECL on the entire country. And today we know the excellent electronic voting machine, which is made by ECL, which has you know, obtained the approval and, you know, and as a reliable and secure machine for in the entire world. India is now today exporting <coughs> electronic voting machines elsewhere also. ECL has done the control and instrumentation for several reactors, space, ERDO, and many strategic activities. All these was because of the foresight of Homi Baba at that time. He also established a nuclear fuel complex and it produces today fuels for the entire country and it has, I should say, uh, today the only, uh, probably the only organization in the world which can produce uh, all things required for the nuclear fuel, starting from the lab material to fuel, etc. Dr. Humi Baba also was the brain behind the third three-stage nuclear power program. I will not go into the details because of the audience uh, being different, but I should say it was, it was he who thought that thorium in our sands will be the most important solution for energy for the country in the coming centuries. And he started a program in a way that thorium can be utilized by the country. Over and over all this, he realized the emphasis, he realized that human resource development is very important for the country in this domain. You cannot keep getting experts from abroad to build your nuclear reactors. So he started a training school 
as early as 1957. And I must say, in the entire world, India is the only country which has operated a training school in a sustainable way year after year for more than 60 years. It has never stopped working. And every year, it provides a, a good number of you know, experts to join the department as young scientific officers and provide boost to the indigenous development of nuclear science and technology. Several leaders of the atomic energy programs, including, you must be knowing, very familiar names like Dr. Kapoorkar, Dr. Srikumar Banerjee, the current chairman, Sri K. N. Vyas, current director of BRC, they are all graduates from BRC training school. I was mentioning to you about this management, which is really par excellence. It is just a few examples here that uh, Bob had a great uh, friend in Jawaharlal Nehru, and you know, he used to approach him for several things whenever the administration or the accounts did not permit the existing rules. As a manager, he could see the needs of management and he was sure that the rules should help the management. So in one case, when the Apsara reactor was to you know, go, go through a, a set of uh, overnight experiments for several days to reach criticality, he was very clear that people who are working around the clock for such a very, very special scientific assignment should be helped to go out and have their dinner and have some rest and come back, for which vehicles should be made available at their disposal. This was not permitted by the, uh, the finance at the time, and he wrote straight away a letter to Nehru at the time to say that we want two cars to be placed at our disposal on a 24-hour basis. And uh, later on he wrote to them, because you have given these cars, we are able to make the criticality throughout night people have worked here. So one could see that he was uh, uh, using his friendship with Nehru in a very, very productive manner. Nehru used to immediately approve such proposals coming from Homi Baba. And when uh, suddenly Lal Bahadur Shastri, who was the next Prime Minister, he died in Tashkent on January 11, 1966, compared to many other organizations, Baba took a very, very unique decision he made a holiday as a working day for TAFR and the atomic energy establishment as a tribute to Shastri. You can see the letter uh, on the right side, which he wrote to Srimati Shastri, wife of Lal Bhagavad Shastri, saying that we want to honor the hardworking Lal Bhagavad Shastri by observing a working day on a holiday. So this was his unique style of management, which you know always gave respect to the entire leadership of the country and also the people working at different levels. Finally, he had a great passion for national nature and aesthetics. And as I mentioned in the beginning, it was not just a hobby for him. It was a serious uh, endeavor. He was a lover of gardens, paintings, musician. He was an architect. He was a renaissance man. Wherever he goes to go, go abroad for attending conferences, he will also attend music programs. He will also attend, look at gardens there. He will come back and try to implement them. He learned so much about art and music that you know many of the architects who came to work for him later, they were really simply amazed. Even the very location of BRC facing Elephant Caves, if any of you have the occasion to visit, you will be amazed that you know, such a great location was chosen by him, which was very secure and at the same time very beautiful. In fact, it was Dr. Homi Baba who suggested that the International Atomic Energy Agency, which is a no international agency of the United Nations, which is foreseeing the activities of atomic energy in all the country, it should be located in Vienna. The choice of the location of Vienna was uh, made by uh, Humi Baba, and that is because he felt science and art have to go together. Beethoven was uh, born at Vienna, Vienna was known for art. He felt that atomic energy also should be celebrated at Vienna. The person who designed TFR, the Chicago based architect, but he said, in this development, that is when he was designing TFR, the architect worked with a client rather than for a client. I worked along with Baba. It is not that uh, I worked for Baba. Because this client displayed unending interest and encouragement and constantly added intelligent suggestions and advice. And because of that, the TFR building is something really is a great pleasure to see. And those of you who have not visited, I am sure that in your lifetime, you must see the TA for once and see what kind of uh, passion would have gone behind this creation. Another architect who worked with him for BRC, he said, as one of the few architects 
who had the privilege privilege of close association with dr baba i witnessed as much of architecture taking root in a man of science as the scientific philosophy guiding our own architectural thinking he had the uncanny knack of being right more often than not in matters of conceit he was able to correct the architects and finally they say trombe was his brain child his architectural laboratory where he had unique opportunity of full scale experimentation with materials textures and building and in fact one of the architects visited his house one of the days and you can see his observation in his house later uh, in a book called kumi baba as artist which was published by uh, jamshed baba in 1968 you can see he say that to and went to his house near his desk an enormous drawing board with huge printed plans pinned to it it appeared that they were the first layouts for the afforestation schemes and suggested gardens at trombe within the area of aet he spent many hours at night poring over his plans trying to visualize visualize in his mind the setting of the new city and by the side of the drawing board were fine illustrated volumes of the gardens of veste english gardens italian japanese all examples his detailed knowledge was tremendous he could describe the essential points of a garden design whether he had seen it in vienna paris rome etc and you can see the appreciation of an architect here for his knowledge of gardens so it's not just hobby that he was trying to make uh, some garden it was his serious passion and you can see on the side, right side a picture of the gardens in uh, trombe it's an example of you know his passion and once he visited derado along with mgk menon who was to be director of the ka for after hobi baba when they went together this is the experience of mgk menon which says as we got out of the car he asked me if i knew what the trees were that were all around i said yes they are sterculia apitara then he replied yes i am going to have an entire avenue of these trombe then i say but homi how do you know how long they will take to grow in his reply i know 100 years but you have to think of the future think big you can think you can now imagine how we conceived our baba adamic research center from the scratch including research laboratories including gardens including landscaping and buildings everything with great detail for 100 years to come and this is something very very unique of a person who was uh, once upon a time just a theoretical physicist and tried to learn theoretical physics from there he came into a very consummate person expert in several topics if this is a picture of the modular laboratory at the brc on is an example of his creation and this is amir bagh garden well in front of the tata uh, institute of fundamental physics this garden was designed again by humbi baba himself it is his artist and uh, his brother says the arts were not just a form of creation or pleasant relaxation for him they were among the most serious pursuits of life he attached as much importance to them as to his works in mathematics and physics for him the arts were what made life worth living he himself was an artist it's not that he was just like that uh, he was commenting on others this is a self portrait drawn by himself at the age of 70 Yeah, how he was looking, and these are some other sketches. In there are a very large number of publications in which you can see the picture of uh, Sri Ramon drawn by Homi Baba. All these are his own drawings. They were both in the uh, color and uh, black and white, with pencil sketch and paintings. And he also designed drama stages. He designed several other auditoriums and several several other things that are which knowledge of art is required. In T A F R, he created a big gallery of paintings by inviting. very very famous painters to come and you know paint there and create murals even today if you go it's a great inspiring sight that in mean, a science laboratory such art pervades of course for such a person awards and honors are very very common he had every award that you can think of starting from the fellow of royal society of london at the very young age and he was 1941 adam prize and so on so forth honorary doctoral degrees in science from so many universities and he was president of the international union of pure and applied physics for one term he was also given padma bhushan by the government of course and it was you know 
one can see that the entire world adored him and respected him for his breadth, breadth of you know, its breadth of excellence. It's not just there. The most important example for us is that when finally United Nations decided to have its international conference on the peaceful uses of atomic energy, the very first conference which was held in, uh, in uh, Geneva, it was the uh, United Nations which invited Dr. Homi Baba to be the president of the conference. And uh, you can see here the picture of Dr. Homi Baba presiding over the conference along with others in 1955. And today, if you go to the International Atomic Energy Agency in Vienna, you will find they have honored Homi Baba by placing a bust of Dr. Baba and uh, Dr. Muhammad El Maldai, who was you know, one of the director generals of the International Atomic Energy Agency, had this to say about him. He was chair of the first international conference on peaceful use of atomic energy held in Geneva in 1955, which laid the foundation for the launch of IAEA data. Legend has it that Dr. Baba cast his vote in favor of Vienna as the seat of the agency's headquarters because of his great love for opera. And as a music lover myself, I have special reason to be grateful to him. Well, with all this, unfortunately, he died prematurely at the age of 56 in the tragic air crash of Air India flight over Mont Blanc uh, on January 1966. But in his letter, in December 1934, to one of his friends, he makes a very, very prophetic uh, statement. And it's very, very important for every one of us to understand. I know quite clearly what I want out of my life. Life and my emotions are the only thing I'm conscious of. I love the consciousness of life and I want as much of it as I can get. But the span of one's life is limited. What comes after death, no one knows, not do I care. Since therefore, you see the statement, I cannot increase the content of life by increasing its duration, but I can increase it by increasing its intensity. And that is why art, music, poetry, everything else that consciousness I have for this one purpose, increasing the intensity of my consciousness of life. One can see that he had some premonition probably, but he was very clear that all of us live on the earth for a limited period of time. Okay, maybe 90 years, maybe 100 years, but still it is a finite number. If you want to increase your contributions during your life, then it is not enough that uh, you, know, you think of one particular pursuit. Whatever you do, you need to really do with great passion. And that is the, uh, that is the lesson that he leaves behind for us. And this will be my last slide. Uh, instead of my own uh, uh, mention about what we need to learn from his life and works, I want to read out from a very famous lecture by Dr. B. D. Srikanta, who was an associate at uh, associate for Homi Baba. He gave a lecture at uh, RRCAD Indoor, and this is what he has summarized. First, is set your goal high. Follow the dictum that nothing is impossible. If Homi Baba had come to India in 1939 back, but at the time, if he had seen the country, if he had imagined that India cannot develop nuclear energy, India does not have enough you know, important uh, intelligent people to do it, then it would have been doomed. He knew that nothing is impossible, provided you have selected the right type of people and created the right kind of atmosphere and motivation. Do not compromise on media or media or TV. Place full confidence in youth. Build activities around people. Judge people by their performance. There is no substitute for hard work. Get the best out of your life. Lastly, inheritance is important. He was born from a great family. He inherited many things. He inherited good life. He inherited books. He inherited knowledge. He inherited, you no, know, he had relatives who could invest for him. But what you make of inheritance is even more important than inheritance itself. So these are the lessons that we need to learn. And every time I read about Homi Baba, these are something which inspires me, even though I do not know whether I am able to practice many of the things which he has said. But I should say that uh, whenever you feel little lonely and you want to learn, uh, get inspired in the people like Lord Homi Baba they are always available in the form of books to you, even today, a number of books. Especially a book written by Dr. G. Venkatraman. It is a very much recommended book, a very, very inexpensive book of uh, about 100 rupees. I am sure that it can inspire you to the rest of the life. Thank you very much for your attention.
And thanks once again for, to MCNS for giving me this opportunity. I don't know whether there can be anything more befitting for this uh, occasion as a first uh, talk for the, I mean, Science Week celebration. And Dr. Vasudeva is well known for his uh, uh, talking ability, but here today what we saw was he just touched upon Dr. C. V. Raman and then uh, talked on uh, Dr. Homi Baba. And every word, every letter that he mentioned was to give inspiration to the uh, people who he reserved. And when we think of Dr. S I mean, Sasiri Raman or Homi Baba, I think it is we need a kind of uh, uh, level even to envy them. So it is such a such a uh, he talked about such a great people, and he is was there himself. He is uh, a versatile person. He is an artist. He is a poet. And uh, so he himself has, he is the right person to talk about uh, Dr. Homi Baba. He's a nuclear, so he, Dr. Homi Baba has taken uh, the responsibility of nuclear energy in India. It is, it is one field which requires everything. For example, it requires all fields of engineering, say electronics, chemical engineering, civil engineering, electrical engineering, mention engineering that is required there. And mention a science like physics, chemistry, biology, botany, you mentioned that, biophysics, biochemistry, everything, and that is required there. And with expertise. And that is the kind of thing that is required for thinking of nuclear energy. And since he was the visionary, and he himself had all the knowledge with him, and he was able to plan it very nicely. So, and uh, it was very um, uh, inspirational. Uh, to everyone who is here and who has been hearing through online and I am very very thankful. We, I, I feel we are all blessed to hear your uh, talk today. And now I think you can take a few questions if there are any. Is there a question? Yes. Dr. CJ, he is a solar physicist Hello, sir. in MCNS. Yeah. Uh, sir, uh... You, it is very clear that Homi Baba had a very great academic research career uh, almost until he returned to India. And once he returned to India, he was burdened with a lot of administrative uh, work to build institutions from TIFR to Bark and other places. Do you think that uh, load of administrative work somehow killed that science he would have produced otherwise? Suppose he would have left free to do pure science. The, the the things he would have created would have been much, I'm not saying administrative is not important is equally important, he built great things here so in this uh, confusion or in this uh, decision which is the right thing to do administration or pure science I'm sure you would have gone across similar uh, emotions at some point uh, what do you think uh, a right thing for a for a uh, upcoming people well, it's a very, very uh, interesting question. I have not seen any articles uh, about Homi Baba where this kind of transition is described. After joining Indian Institute of Science, for seven years he continued to be active in research. It's not that he stopped research after the coming to Indian Institute of Science immediately, but after he realized that you know, he has to build institutions and start programs, Yes, he, read, he sacrificed. In fact, this statement is made by several people that he, at the peak of his career, he sacrificed his uh, scientific interest for the country. That is true. But you can see the other point that if you are creative, you can be creative, be creative in everything that you do. It is not just necessary that you have to do science. He was creative in, in, in you know, starting an atomic energy program. He envisioned it. He was the person who envisioned even electronics, he envisioned manpower, everything, and he worked for all of them. And you can see during that period, he also built uh, you know, not only institutions, but buildings, God, and everything. So I think his mind was fully occupied, and he could have taken even more, and he could have done probably science also, as you mentioned. But then he wanted to devote 
probably in his time to the country's science and technology development. One of the put aside from that, he was very clear all the time. When he was a student, he said he has to do physics. And once he decided that he has to develop atomic energy in the country, he, I think, focused on that theme. And I don't think he would have felt any loss. Because his focus was very clear and he was out to achieve. Any other question? Any other question in the chat box? No. If there are no questions, uh, I thank uh, uh, Dr. Vasudev Rao for his uh, excellent uh, uh, talk today. He started this uh, series of lectures by an inspirational uh, beginning talk. And uh, I, I request uh, and welcome Dr. Vasudev Rao to attend all other lectures. Uh, so it is, it is open for everyone who has the link there. You know? and, uh, and we will also welcome your suggestions at the end of uh, this uh, science week and also advice from you. And thank you very much, Dr. Rao. Thank you. Thanks all the participants who are assembled here and also who are, who are uh, listening through the through online and I, I welcome all of them. I invite all of them to continue coming to these uh, uh, talks uh, which, which is uh, spread over one week. I, wanted, I want all of you to be there for all the uh, talks uh, that are being arranged here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Goodbye.